Good morning, party people, and welcome to office hours in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. Uh, so it is a sunny Saturday morning here. It's about 8 a.m. The sun has risen, so it's time for me to uh, stumble down to the restaurant and go get some breakfast. But first, I figured I would go answer a few of your questions. So first up, and if you want to see how to answer ask questions, hit the link in the description on the video. Um, so first up, Paul asked, what are your thoughts on being a Microsoft MVP? I don't usually look at the questions first, but I happened to look at this one before the webcast started. So my thoughts on being an MVP. I, it's what you have to know, and so I think I'm, I'm probably more qualified than a lot of people to answer it because I wasn't an MVP, then Microsoft gave me the MVP status for I don't know how many years it was, six, seven, eight years, and then I turned in my MVP status, gave it up. And so what you have to realize is it's a bit of a trade-off. The benefits that you get are you get a badge from Microsoft that you can use on things like your slide decks, your business cards. I don't know if people still use business cards. Uh, that gives you an air of credibility that customers believe you have technical competence. There is no technical test to become an MVP. So you have to be aware that some of the people who hold that badge hold it for reasons that you might not hold it. They might hold it because Microsoft values their contributions to sales, to getting the word out about a specific product. You know, sometimes they desperately need to get the word out about a product and nobody wants to talk about it and someone will and that person will become an MVP. Um, so the, the, what you get is that badge of credibility. You get some software licensing and some Azure credits. It's not a whole heck of a lot, honestly. I don't think you can even run a decent VM 24-7 with it. Um, but when you don't have it, it looks really compelling. And it is. It helps your career. It helps your career. It may help you get customers. The downside is, is you get a lot of pressure from Microsoft saying uh, an MVP should blog about this, an MVP should behave this way, like an MVP shouldn't say anything negative about Microsoft products. And there were a lot of times when I got pushback from people at Microsoft saying, you know, I'm going to ask that Microsoft take away your MVP because I can't believe you would write something like this. And at some point, I, I just gave it up by going, okay, I've had my fun on this ride. Um, the benefits weren't that big to me. Because you notice what one of the benefits isn't is, you don't really get any input over product decisions. By the time that Microsoft brings you something as an MVP, that cake is baked. And there's almost nothing that you can do about innate quality problems or building the wrong product. Um, you also don't get that much advanced notice either. I mean, you really notice that with new versions of SQL Server, or new versions of utilities as they drop. It used to be 10, 20 years ago that MVPs would have real advanced knowledge and they would use that advanced knowledge in order to further the community knowledge. Like say, you know, SQL Server 2019 would drop and there would be 10 well-written blog posts, well-documented, well-thought-out from MVPs. Not for 2019, but like years ago, 2005, 2008. Uh, today, and I'm going to use 2019 as an example, you know, any, uh, when 2019 came out, it wasn't like there was a plethora of uh, good documentation blog posts from MVPs about how you use it or whatever. Because MVPs are just like you. They are strapped for time just like everybody else is. They don't have an unlimited amount of free time to go learn a product. What I found as a consultant was that working with my clients who were in early access programs, I actually had better access through that uh, than I did as an MVP. And I didn't have to sign as many NDAs. So that kind of worked out pretty well. Um, so that's, that's kind of my thoughts on uh, what the whole thing is like there. I, I don't know that it's, so uh, yeah, so that, that probably answers the question. I probably don't need to beat that one to death. Let's see here. Come on up. Use face ID. Come on up. There we go. Next up, we have Lance. Lance says, I have a server running SCCM that gets unsafe assembly errors. Are unsafe assemblies something that I need to worry about? I have absolutely no idea. I don't work with SS, SCCM and I don't work with uh, a CLR code. 
Next question, Arcean or Arslan asks, Hi Brent, what are the top issues that you see related to customers running SQL CLR? Now it's funny because I just said I, I don't work with CLR, right? So the issues that I see when customers use it uh, is they think it's going to be really easy to manage memory because they've never had to worry about managing memory in their .NET applications before and they're not really paying attention to how much memory their CLR code uses. So their CLR code will go off and do all kinds of crazy things and they are robbing memory from SQL Server. You can't use that memory to cache data. The other thing that they won't notice is how bad latency is in CLR compared to regular things that you would do in a database. Like I've seen customers say, well, I'm just going to go call this web service real quick. And, you know, the SQL server lives in New York and the web service lives in Chicago. And next thing you know, you have really long latency uh, because people who were calling the CLR code didn't realize how far it was going. Uh, so those are the two big ones, memory consumption and uh, added latency to queries. Next up, Anil asks, could bare metal SQL Server safely utilize NAS storage, network attached st attach storage for data files, or is it recommended to only use SAN storage, aka faster and more expensive? That The advice around that it was different like five or ten years ago than it is today. Today I hear people say things like, you should never use NAS uh, for SQL Server. And I'm like, hey, yo, if you work in the cloud, cloud storage, is way worse than NAS storage. It's stunning how bad a lot of cloud storage is. Microsoft Azure's premium storage is a great example of that. Premium storage is slower than a USB flash drive. Uh, so if you keep things in perspective, uh, today's network attached storage devices aren't necessarily much worse than cloud storage. So don't, don't, I wouldn't make blanket statements. Um, of course, the, the ultimate answer is you need storage that is fast enough and reliable enough for whatever your business needs are, and everybody's business needs are different. Some people are totally okay with network attached storage. Next up, uh, Hassan says, Hi Brent, what are the origins of SQL bits? And do you have any epic stories from SQL bits? You know, the origins, I don't really know that well. I know that Simon Sabin, James Roland Jones, oh, who's Father Jack? Father Jack on Twitter, I can't remember uh, Father Jack's real name. Now that's going to drive me crazy. And his wife, Mrs. Father Jack. Um, there are a bunch of people, fantastic people out of the United Kingdom, and I'm going to offend somebody by forgetting names, and it's going to drive me crazy. And I should know that because I'm going over to SQL Bits in like a month. Uh, but they started it in the UK as a mix of a paid and a free conference. And the, the big signature thing with SQL Bits has always been the event. They, on the Friday night before the free day, there's this massive party, and it's uh, what the Brits call a fancy dress party, aka a costume party. And it's unbelievably epic. They do a fantastic job. They really take the party seriously. And the party is what I think makes that conference special. Uh, it's also really affordable. It's affordable compared to a lot of other conferences when you consider what all you get and that a lot of other conferences were like stripping away the party aspect uh, as uh, as the conference went on. And as times got tough financially. Um, do I have any epic stories? The epic story is always the party. Jeez, the party is fantastic every year. And every year I'm like, I don't know how they topped the prior year. So I'm really looking forward to this year's uh, sequel bits. I have my costume for sequel bits already. Um, it had to be small and packable because for those of us coming over from uh, other continents, like, you know, I fly over, I'll be flying from here, from Cabo. Um, I got to be able to fit it into a suitcase, and I, ideally, I don't want it too big. So, for example, uh, a couple of years ago, I did an inflatable. Was it a dragon? I had some kind of inflatable animal that I was riding, which I adored, and it had a built-in little air compressor, and I had a USB-C battery pack in my back pocket so that I could keep inflating it through the course of the night. And the nice thing about things like inflatable costumes is they're kind of discardable. I was never going to wear that again. So after the party finished, I went over to the expo hall and uh, changed clothes in the sequel sentry booth. 
uh, I, uh, nobody was around and I'm like, okay, watch this. I'm just going to take off my clothes, put on my, my, uh, or like I had jeans underneath it. So I just stripped this dragon inflatable dragon costume off and, uh, left the inflatable dragon costume in the sequel bits, uh, booth just as kind of a laugh. I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, and all the sequel sentry guys gave me hell over that. Branch, you're using our, 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 uh, booth as a changing, uh, thing. Um, next up, Jim asks, how does Postgres query tuning compare with SQL Server query tuning? Man, I suck at it. I suck so bad at Postgres query tuning. Um, the rules are different, like CTEs are optimization fences. Uh, it's harder to read an execution plan. There's not something like SQL Server Management Studios viewer of execution plan. There are these online web-based ones, kind of like Pace the Plan, that are more powerful and more commonly used. And then the last question that we'll go with, uh, Samir says, do we ever have to worry about disk, not page, but disk fragmentation with SQL Server? Typically with today's storage, everything's random access anyway, like you're dealing with solid state storage by definition is random access that the uh, drives and the NAND will automatically do where leveling, they'll write to different places on the storage. So effectively all access is random access anyway with solid state. Even if you're still using magnetic storage, it's not like you have one drive, you have pools of drives that are often shared across pools of servers, all of which are active at exactly the same time. So disk fragmentation is highly irrelevant for performance on today's SQL servers. Um, there are edge cases, sure. There, you know, say one in 10,000 SQL servers has dedicated storage uh, that is just for itself and it's all magnetic and they do scans of tables, but it's an extreme edge case scenario uh, as opposed to most SQL servers. All right, well, my restaurant is uh, in the condo complex is getting ready to order here. I'm going to probably go have some chilaquiles or some huevos rancheros. Uh, and then today, it's a Sunday. I am probably, I haven't been down. This beach here isn't swimmable. This, I know it looks really super calm and peaceful from this angle, but uh, the currents and uh, tides are really strong here. And they, because we're right at the bottom of the Sea of Cortez, or right at the tip of the Baja Peninsula, the ocean waves come through here and the currents just uh, take you right out into the Sea of Cortez and, and it, humans aren't gonna survive those tides or currents. So every year here, people die trying to swim. Um, I know, so you won't see me going and putting my foot in the water there. Although people do fishing off the edge of here, but uh, instead that's why we spend so much time in the pools. So I will see y'all at the next office hours. Adios. Mm -hmm.